Chapter 3, Lifting and Moving Patients. Uh, so in terms of preparatory, basically the safety, wellness, and well-being of the emergency medical responder, uh, medical legal issues that may occur on the scene as they await for the higher level of care to arrive. Um, workforce safety and wellness, so again, going over the standard safety precautions, personal protective equipment, stress management, prevention of response-related injuries, um, moving and lifting patients. So you will gain a knowledge of um, operational roles, responsibilities to ensure safe patient, public, and personnel safety. So as an EMR, you want to analyze the emergency situation. Um, you want to quickly evaluate the patient's condition, carry out effective life-saving emergency medical procedures. Uh, this may include lifting, moving, or positioning the patient. Um, every time you move a patient, you always want to keep in mind, do not do any further harm to the patient. Uh, move the patient only if it is necessary. Move the patient as few times as possible. Keep the patient's body as one unit, meaning you're not going to move the head and then the feet and then the torso. It's going to be on one swift movement. You want to use proper lifting and moving techniques and you want to use one have one rescuer giving the commands because when a bunch of people are talking you don't know who's in charge and that causes issues in the in the long run so you want to consider these recommendations um, delay moving the patient if possible until additional EMS um, personnel have arrived so if it's just you remember you're not a superhero so um, you want to make sure that there's enough people to be able to safely and effectively move the patient. Do not step over the patient and explain what you're doing. A lot of times we forget to do that. Um, I will be moving you to the left. I will be um, turning you onto your side. Hello, my name is so-and-so, and this is what I will be doing. So keep the rules of good body mechanics in mind. So you want to keep, you want to know your own physical limitations. If you have trouble lifting a 20-sack pack of rice, um... Lifting a patient may be kind of difficult for you. You want to keep that in mind. Um, keep yourself balanced. Maintain a firm footing. Lift and lower the patient by bending your legs, not your back. So it's as if you're doing like a squat. Try to keep your arms close to your body for strength and balance. Move the patient as few times as possible. Unconscious patients who have not suffered trauma should be placed in a recovery position. Uh, this is so that their airway can be opened and it allows for the secretions to drain right out of their mouth. Um, this is found in figure 3-1 on page 35. body mechanics. Um, so improper lifting or moving techniques can result in injury to you and or the patient. So good body mechanics, um, you use the strength of the large muscles in your legs and you lift the patient instead of using your back. This is in figure 3-2 on page 38. 
I'm sorry, 35. So good, good body mechanics again. You keep your back straight. You lift without twisting. You ensure that you have a firm footing before you start to lift or move the patient. You assess the weight of the patient and know your physical limitations. Cannot stress this one enough. Good body mechanics. Um, so additional personnel if needed, you want to call for that. You want to communicate with all the members of the lifting team. We're going to lift on three, okay? One, two, three, and then you lift. Practice lifts and moves. Move a patient immediately in the following situations. If there's danger of fire, if there's an explosion or structural collapse that may exist, if there's hazardous materials that may be present, <clears throat> If the emergency scene cannot be protected, it's otherwise impossible to gain access to other patients who need life-saving care. And if the patient has experienced a cardiac arrest. Those are all situations when they need to be moved immediately. So here we have the emergency drag. So the closed drag is simply a way to move the patient. You grasp the patient's clothing at the neck and shoulder area. The rest of the patient's, you rest the patient's head in your arms and you drag the patient out of danger. This picture is found um, on page 35. It is figure 3-3. cardiac patient and the closed drag. So in a room in which you find the patient, um, if it's not large enough, you wanna move the patient out. So you wanna drag the patient from the tight space and quickly move furniture out of the way. And then you would provide CPR. Um, this figure is found uh, three, four on page 66. Then we have the blanket drag. So you wanna use this drag if the, if the patient is not dressed or is dressed in clothing that can tear easily. Um, you wanna place the, rag, the rug on the floor and roll the patient onto it. Um, pull the patient to safety by dragging the rug. Um, this is found figure 3-5 on page 66. Um, arm to arm drag. So you want to place your arm under the patient's armpit, around the back, and grasp the patient's forearm. You want to, it, it's used for a heavier patient. And so um, it, you want to offer support to their head and to their neck. Uh, this is found in figure 3-6 on page 37. Then we have the fireman drag where you would tie the patient's arms together. Um, you would get down on your hands and knees and straddle the patient. And then you're going to pass the patient's tied arms around your neck, straighten your arms, and drag the patient across the floor. This is found in figure 3-7 on page 37. Uh, emergency drag from a vehicle. So if it's only one rescuer, you're gonna grasp the patient around the arms and cradle the patient's head below your arm. 
between your arms, sorry. You want to pull the patient's head onto a horizontal position as you ease him and him or her out of the vehicle. This is found in figure 3-8 on page 37. Emergency drag from a vehicle, if it's uh, two or more people, um, you'll have one person supporting the head and the neck. Someone else um, moves the patient by lifting under the arm. And the patient is removed with the head and the neck stabilized in a neutral position. Uh, you'll use a, a, a backboard when time permits. Carried for non-ambulatory patients. So you have um, two-person extremity carrying. And so the one rescuer is going to reach under the patient's arms and grasp the patient's wrist. The second one is going to reach between the patient's legs and grasp behind the patient's knees. So the two rescuers stand up and carry the patient away. This is found in figure 3-9 on page 38. Uh, Two-person seat carry. Uh, basically, the rescuer is going to kneel on opposite sides of the patient near the patient's hips. The rescuer is going to raise the patient in a sitting position. Their arms will be linked together behind the patient's back. Um, the rescuer places the other arm around the patient's knees and links with each other. So no equipment is going to be required for this. And this is found um, figure 310 on page 38. Uh, so cradle in the arm, uh, it's used by one patient to carry a child. Basically, you're going to kneel beside the patient and place one arm around the back of um, around the back and under the patient's thigh. Uh, you're going to lift slightly and roll the patient onto the hollow form of your arm and chest. Uh, this is found in figure 311 on page 39. Then we have care for non-ambulatory patients, uh, two-person chair carry. So one rescuer is going to stand behind the seat and grasp the back of the chair. The other one will tilt the chair backwards so the rescuer can grasp the two front legs. Um, So the, the rescuer one will give the command, the lift, and then they'll walk away. Um, so this is found figure 312 on page 39. Uh, over here we have the back strap carry. Uh, basically, you're going to have the back onto the patient as he or she is standing. Um, you're gonna grasp them at the wrist and um, across the and cross the arms across your chest. Uh, pull them onto your back. Um, bend forward to lift the patient standing up, and then you'll walk away. And this is found in Figure three thirteen on page. 
39. Direct ground lift. So it's used to move a patient who's on the ground or the floor of an ambulance stretcher. Um, basically what you want to do is um, you want to make sure that there's no traumatic injury and the skills for this is found in drill 3-1. Transforming a patient from, from bed to stretcher. So place the stretcher next to the bed. Lift the, lift the bottom sheet underneath the patient and then you're going to loggle the patient onto the sheet. Um, you're going to reach across and reach across the stretcher, grasp the sheet, um, and blink it firmly at the patient's head, chest, hips, and knees. And then you'll slide them onto the stretcher in that manner. Um, that's found on figure 314, page 42. Here we have assist um, with an ambulatory patient. So if it's just one person, you're going to help the, per the patient to stand. You're going to have them place one arm around your neck and you're going to hold their wrist. Then you're going to pull your free arm around their waist and help them walk. If it's a two-person assist, then um, you you want to make sure that the patient is not bearing weight, and the two it's rescuers the two rescuers will be supporting the patient. And that's what we have here at this picture. Uh, this picture is found, uh, figure 316, on page 42. All right, so wheeled ambulance stretcher. So one of the most commonly used devices with EMS. Uh, you can raise it, you can lower it, um, it has a belt to secure the patient, it's uh, pretty effective. So this is found um, in figure 312 on page 75. Um, so the stretcher can be rolled by two or four people. So if it's a smooth surface, it's it's pretty easy to glide. You just have one person in front guiding. Um, if, the lo if the loaded stretcher must be carried, it's best to have four people, one at each corner. Um, if the stretcher must be carried through a narrow area, then you'll only have Two people that can fit. Sorry. Uh, taking a look at a portable stretcher, um, it's used when wheel stretchers cannot be used, so um, in maybe a small space. Um, uh, it can. It can carry in in the same way that a wheel stretcher does. It's just mainly for uh, space purposes. And this one is found in figure 318 on page 45.
um, chair, stair, uh, chairs, chair, stair, chairs, sorry. <laughs> Um, so this is found in figure 319 on page 45. Um, basically, it's a portable moving device that is used to carry a patient in a sitting position. Um, it's uh, basically lightweight, easy to carry, um, and... You wouldn't use someone who has a lot of trauma to sit on this. They would be on a regular backboard. Um, this one is found in figure 319 on page 45. Uh use of immobilized patients that have neck or back injuries. So it's used to um, lift patients, immobilize lower extremities and long backwards. They're used to move patients who have experienced, experienced trauma. Um, it's useful for lifting and moving patients who are in small spaces. That's a long backboard. Um, so basically it's made out of plastic or fiberglass. Um, it has straps to secure the patient to it. Um, so if they sustain like a back or neck injury or head, everything will be immobilized. And this is found in figure 320, page 45. Uh, we have the scoop stretcher. It's helpful for moving patients in small spaces. Um, it's not used for head or spinal injuries. Uh, there is a drill for skills 3-2 uh, in using scoop stretchers. So in an emergency situation, uh, you would use wide, sturdy planks, um, doors, boarding, um, ironing boards, sturdy folding tables, um, full-length lawn chair recliners, surfboards, snowboards. Remember, you, you have to improvise sometimes. So anytime a patient is suspected of having a traumatic injury, um, something to the head, to the neck, or to the spine, um, this area must be immobilized <clears throat> um, so that there's no permanent damage or potential paralysis. So by mobilize, immobilizing it, you're basically putting it into a neutral position. So over here we have uh, cervical collars. Um, they're used to prevent the excess movement of the head and neck. Uh, head and neck. Uh, so there's a soft cervical collar, and um, that doesn't do very much. And then there's the rigid cervical collar, which is what's used in the traumas. Applying a cervical collar. Um, so it should be bef should be applied before the patient is placed on a backboard because you want to make sure that you're not moving that area, that you're immobilizing it. Um, this picture is found in figure 324 on page 48. Um, so patients should be transported 
on a backboard. Uh, it, it includes anyone who has a spinal um, trauma, a motor vehicle crash, or fall. So any person who has sustained gunshot wounds to the trunk as well. So again, if you suspect that there's an injury, move the patient in one unit, transport the patient face up, move the patient's um, head and neck in a neutral position. I'm sorry, keep it in a neutral position. You want to avoid moving it. Um, be sure that all the rescuers understand what it what is to be done. Um, and you want to be sure that only one person is saying what the commands are. So after the short backward device is applied, the patient is carefully placed on the, on the backboard. Um, so we have skills 3-3, uh, three, three, which kind of goes through that. Uh, then we have log rolling. So the primary technique is um, it's used to move a patient onto a long uh, backboard. So it requires at least four people to do so. Um, the movement technique of choice for all patients with suspected spinal injuries. So again, we don't want to cause further injury or paralysis. So if there's a suspected injury, this is what we would use. And there's a skill for the log roll and three, four. <clears throat> so all patients' um, commands have two parts. There's a question and then the order of movement. So move the patient as a unit. Keep the patient's head in a neutral position um, at all times. Cannot stress that enough. So we have a straddle lift here. Um, basically it can be used on a patient in a backboard if there's not enough space to perform a log roll. Um, this is found in figure 326-1952. All right, so the straddle lift, it's gonna require about five people. One person's gonna be at the head and the neck. The other one's going to be at the shoulders and the chest. The next one will be at the hips and the thighs. Um, the next one will be at the legs. And the last one is um, the insertion backboard under the patient. Um, and the lift should be practiced often. Because with five people trying to be coordinated all at once, it's going to take some practice. So if the straddles, in the straddle slide, the patient, rather than the backboard, is moved. So um, this is found in figure um, 326 on page 52. So with the straddle side slide, um, it may be useful when the patient is in an extremely narrow uh, space. So the rescuer's positions are going to be the same as we stated, one at the head and neck, one at the um, chest and shoulders, one at the hips and thighs, one at the feet, and one at the board. 
So you're going to lift the patient as one unit. You're going to lift the patient... Um, you're going to slide the patient forward about 10 inches at a time. Uh, each rescuer is going to lean forward slightly and use a swing motion to bring the patient onto the board. So every patient who's on a backboard has to be strapped down. That's how we prevent them from slipping and sliding. So the strap should be long enough to go around the board and um, around the larger patient. So straps six to nine feet uh, should work. And this picture is found in figure um, 327 on page 53. So once the patient is centered onto the board, you're going to secure the upper torso straps. You're going to secure the pelvis, the lower legs, using um, the pads as needed. Um, this picture is found in figure 228 on page 53. So head immobilization. A blanket roll is like an improvised version of this. Um, so you're going to fold and roll the blanket as seen in figure 3-5. Um, Um, so basically what you're going to do is you're going to stabilize and maintain, you're going to stabilize by maintaining the blanket roll as shown in drill six, I'm sorry, drill three, six. So head stabilization must be maintained through the entire procedure. Um, the blanket roll must be fitted securely under the patient's shoulder. Um, you're going to secure the blanket roll to the head with two um, crevice ties around the blanket roll. Then you're going to use two more cravats to bind the head and the blanket roll on the backboard. So we have a picture here um, of the foam blocks that are quickly applied to provide good stabilization to the head and the neck. Um, that picture is found in figure 329 on page 56. Summary. So... Uh, Great guidelines when moving patients. Do not further harm the patient. Move the patient only when necessary. Move the patient as little as possible. Move the patient's body as a unit. Use proper lifting and moving techniques. Have one rescue give commands while moving a patient. Unconscious patients should not be th that have not sustained any trauma should be in the recovery position. Um, if a, pa a patient is on the floor of the ground during an emergency situation, you may have to drag them away from the scene instead of trying to lift and carry the person. Do not lift or carry a patient who is suspected of a spinal injury. 
unless it is necessary to move them for life-threatening reasons. EMS services typically have wheeled um, ambulance stretchers, portable stretchers, chair, stair chairs, long blackboard, long backboards, short backboards, and scoop stretchers. So the cervical collar is going to prevent excessive movement of the head and the neck. The log rolling is the primary technique that is used to move a patient onto a backboard. Once a patient has been secured to the backboard, the head and the neck must be immobilized. Review. Number one, as an EMR, you may injure your back even if it is straight. If you, A, lift with your back bent forward at the hips, B, align your shoulders under your hips, C, hold your hands close to your legs, D, turn, D, use your leg muscles. And the answer is A. Lift with your back bent forward at the hips. Two. A patient who was transported on a backboard include any patient who's A. Intoxicated B. Requested C has an upper extremity injury, D, has sustained gunshot wounds to the trunk. And the answer is, D, has sustained gunshot wounds to, to the trunk. Number three, head immobilization. A. It is not required in any it is not required in any patient who is placed on a backboard. B can be achieved using head blocks or towel rolls. C does not need to be maintained during the backboarding process. D can be properly established only with special equipment. And the answer is B can be achieved using head blocks or towels. And this concludes chapter three.